Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Caroline Griffin, and I lead operations and events for the Riot organization. Um, we're really excited to have Mike and Igor here from the Tiroli Law Firm. Uh, Tiroli Law Firm's been a sponsor of Riot for a few years now. Um, they're, they're just great to work with, and we're really excited, as I said, to have them here. Just a couple of reminders before we get started. This is going to be recorded and will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and to the meetup page, which you registered for this event. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat box throughout the presentation. Um, at the end, you can also feel free to unmute yourself and ask those questions out loud. But for now, if you don't mind keeping yourself muted throughout the presentation. Um, but without further ado, I will hand it over to the guys you were here to see today. So um, thank you for being here, Mike and Igor. Um, we'll let you guys get started. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. We only have kind of an odd setup. We have one microphone. And it's not on my computer. Uh, it's <laughs> on, on Igor's. And we're still trying to socially distance. So, um, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. It looks like we have uh, a number of people that have uh, been with us on another presentation, which I think is a good sign that we at least give decent enough presentations that uh, people are coming back for seconds. Either that or, you know, quarantine has gotten so bad and you're now down to want to learn about IP law uh, <laughs> as, uh, as an alternative to staring at uh, the wall anymore. So, um, so today, what we want to talk about is uh, what exactly infringement of IP means. Um, as we said in the advertisement uh, for this Lunch and Learn, you know, infringement's one of those things that everyone kind of knows intuitively what it means, but they don't know precisely what it means. It's, it's more like they know it when they see it. So we're going to give you, um, after we do our introductions, we'll give you examples of IP, uh, you know, the four major categories, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. And then uh, examples of infringement in those cases. So um, that should kind of help you help guide the lay person to have a cursory understanding of, if, you know, if, if something's infringing. It's not, it's, it's not intended to be a legal uh, analysis. It's just more that, you know, is this something that you should probably contact an attorney about? And to that effect, uh, as Igor reminded me, we probably need to give a uh, disclaimer today uh, that um, you know, unless you have uh, signed an uh, engagement agreement with us, uh, our law firm does not represent you, and uh, this uh, entire presentation should not be construed as legal advice, but merely, you know, information uh, that might, uh, might justify contacting a, a professional if you have any uh, questions that, that might pertain to you or any of your businesses. So, with that in mind, uh, a lot of you have uh, talked with us before, so we won't spend too much time talking about our, our law firm, um, but uh, our firm represents anywhere from Fortune 100 companies to companies of three to five people, um, you know, and everything in between. Uh, basically, we provide uh, patent and, and trademark uh, drafting and prosecution services. Uh, we have over 30 attorneys that work in practically every tech area that you could name. Um, and many of our attorneys hold uh, master's uh, degrees or above. Uh, as far as I go, um, I've been working with the firm since 2004, uh, and I am the vice chair of the software and electrical group for the patent division of the firm, and I also do some trademarks. Um, I uh, have prosecuted or drafted well over 3,000 patent applications. Um, and uh, I've worked on so many different different corners, it all seems to run together these days. Uh, and then I'd also like to take a chance to introduce everyone to Igor Ozaruga. Um, Igor has a very similar background to me. Uh, he uh, has been with us since 2012, um, and he also works in the software and electrical uh, patent world, uh, primarily. Uh, but very interesting with Igor, Igor is uh, from uh, originally from the Ukraine and moved here uh, as a small child, but because of that, he has a lot of family that still lives in, in the Ukraine, and I've gotten the opportunity to learn uh, a lot of interesting things about the Ukraine, and, and the most interesting thing that I found is how great the candy is in the <laughs> Ukraine. I, I, 
I don't normally, before I, I met him, I never thought of that as a country. I always think of sausages and that sort of thing from Ukraine, but no, no, the, the candy is fantastic. And every time I get wind that either he or somebody in his family is going to back to Ukraine, I always uh, put my candy order in uh, to, get, to get a box or two uh, from him. So Igor is going to be starting us out today to talk about uh, trademarks. So you want to take yeah. it from here? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh... So I guess we're going to first dive in in the first section of I, our IP focus is trademarks. So trademarks is just another way of referring to a brand. And we essentially deal with brands every day in some way, shape, or form from like our local grocery store here to a restaurant to technology stores. Uh, trademarks essentially provide a company many advantages in its particular field, including marketing uh, advantages, legal and financial ones. Uh, so essentially, trademarks are very important tools to a company's objective and goals. For example, uh, it can stop other companies from being able to legally use any of your logos or marks, names or signs or the like, and it stops or prevents the products or services from being passed off as theirs. So probably a really good example is we can consider Pepsi. I mean, that logo is very iconic now, but when it initially just initiated as an idea Nobody thought it was going to be worth millions or billions, maybe you can argue. Uh, without, you know, current trademark protection, Pepsi along the way would have been for sure knocked off, uh, which would have diluted their goodwill and obviously at the end hurt their business. Um, one of the other important advantages of trademarks is they can be licensed. So, for example, uh, most people don't know that McDonald's, you can actually license their uh, trademarks. Uh, However, the licensing agreements have to be kind of construed in a particular way and have provisions that give the trademark owner still control over how the trademark is used and, you know, to protect its goodwill and its reputation. W without these kind of provisions, I mean, if you license somebody your trademark, I mean, they're free to use it any way they want, which in the end, it, it could hurt, actually harm the comp your uh, company. Another kind of important advantage of it is an effective communication tool. Essentially, one trademark can convey a lot of intellectually and emotional information about your, you know, about your company's product and service. And it's essentially a very efficient way and a quick way, obviously, to market your product. You can convey a, a lot of information with, for example, one symbol. Uh, you know, one a good example that comes to mind is, uh, you know, Nike swoosh symbol. Uh, you know, it's a swoosh, but it's become recognized in, in such a particular way that it stands out in the essentially in the sporting industry and they kind of cross over into some other industries as well. So a tr having a trademark essentially gives you brand recognition and allows your company to essentially stick, stick out among your, uh, I guess, competitors. And one of the other also advantages is when, especially on a startup side and when you're recruiting a, a potential employees, uh, your trademark can actually have an influence on your company's reputation. And I, I think one of the good examples is kind of a company that IPO this year was Snowflake. Uh, now they were, before the IPO, they were getting this, like you can call it positive rep reputation. And by the time the IPO, and at this time, a lot of people would probably like to work for Snowflake if they had choose, you know, or pick up employers. Another importance of a trademark it increases your company's goodwill so goodwill is basically like the inherent value of the trademark and i think one of the best examples obviously is apple uh you know they're everybody everybody wants uh almost everybody wants uh the apple product and then you know that it's well recognized name and brand you know although what's what's under the hood might be maybe argued and paints a different story but you know, they've, they've built this goodwill over the years that is kind of demands this in the technical industry. Yeah, one of the best examples of that, just for everyone, is uh, Hostess. When Hostess went bankrupt, effectively, uh, they sold their intellectual property, which was their goodwill of their company, so that another company could come in and make their products and use the same, the, the same logo. So it's interesting, you actually license the goodwill and, and everything that you have when it comes to IP. So now we're going to dive into a little bit and take a look at, well, what do all these trademark symbols mean? We, we see them kind of on the internet or on products and, you know, what, what does each one offer in terms of from the legal perspective? So the first symbol, the TM is basically, it indicates an unregistered trademark. So for example, a word, a phrase or logo, it's 
essentially grants you common law rights and not federal rights. In other words, it's really more territorial based on, for example, our, you know, the state you're located in. Uh, for a startup, it's actually good practice to use the TM symbol initially on goods and products, uh, you know, before, you know, you file, let's say, a, a federal application for a registered trademark. Uh, this way, you have some ground and footing to, you know, dissuade others from kind of copying your uh, mark. In most jurisdictions, you're able to enforce your rights with the, uh, the unregistered trademark if, if you need to, but you got to show that you use the mark first, and then you need to be also use the same trademark after you cause a confusion in the marketplace. So you got to show that you use it first and that it's, you know, that somebody else is using a mark and causing confusion. One of the things you might be wondering now is, well, why would I get a registered trademark if I can, I can get just the unreg unregistered version? Kind of in a, in a nutshell, in a short version, unregistered trademarks are essentially inferior to registered trademarks. Uh, and for one example I'll give is that if you end up actually going to court to protect your trademark, the protection offered by the unregistered trademark is very limited in terms of how much money you can recoup. So should you rely on a, you know, on the registered trademark or unregistered trademark when you're essentially a startup? Uh, the best approach is get the unregistered one as it puts the notice onto the public that, hey, you know, I have a trademark there. And then when you are able to get a registered one, what, what's nice about the registered one, it creates what is known as a legal presumption that you hey, are, in fact, the owner of the trademark. And you don't need to prove any under any common, common law that you are the owner. And likewise, it's actually easier for uh, startups to defend a registered trademark relative to unregistered one, as you would have to prove more uh, what we call elements or facts in, in the situation. And turning to the SM symbol, which is really, it, it's a symbol used for service marks, similar to the one that's used for non-services, it's also not registered. So you're only relying on common law rights. You don't get the benefit of a federal law protection. Uh, the C, C symbol, which is next here in line, is used to inform others that you own an original work. So we'll, we're going to get deep, deeper in detail what is considered an original work. However, since 1989, you really are not required to put a, a copyright symbol on, you know, on your original work. However, there are advantages to having this symbol present. Uh, for one, it kind of gives a copyright infringer uh no way to say that hey i didn't know about you know that i was basically you know copying your work uh however they could argue i mean because the industries has been changing so much and the symbol has disappeared and people take works from other and insert into theirs that the symbol could get lost along the way and they're you know able to wiggle out of that uh the next symbol there as you can see is kind of the little circle p symbol that's really used to indicate a copyright of a sound recording so it's the recording itself it does not cover like the music the lyrics the words or the essentially the underlying content so the underlying content is basically we got to distinguish here is like the music and lyrics and a recording of an artist performing that song would be a song recording. So I think probably best to kind of visualize this by as an example. So the song Rolling in the Deep, which was uh, authored uh, by Adele and Paul Epworth, and a recording of Aretha Franklin singing the song Rolling in the Deep, they're obviously two distinct words. However, the underlying music lyrics are a musical work, and the recording of an artist performing the sound song is the song recording. Therefore, it would be a copyright of a sound recording. Now, the last symbol, this one's tricky because it's not an intellectual property marking symbol. It's just used to indicate kosher. And many people think this kind of is an IP symbol, but it, but it's not. It's so. Yeah, I saw this one on, a, a while back on my A1 steak sauce. And I thought, is, is there an IP mark that I wasn't <laughs> knowing? So I had to look it up. But uh, yeah, so you means kosher. It's very interesting. <laughs> Now, as I, as I mentioned, uh, you're not required to register a trademark, but there are obviously clear advantages of registering your trademark, what is under the federal statute we call the Lanham Act, which is primary 
primary statute, which uh, trademarks get protected. So kind of one of the big advantages of registering your trademark is probably best to see in view of a non-registered trademark. So like I mentioned, a non-registered trademark is only regional protection. It doesn't extend to other regions. So for example, if you get a, a, you know, you have your trademark here in North Carolina, it doesn't mean it extends to South Carolina. However, by contrast, if you hit, if you got federal rod registration, this kind of gives you automatically this national protection. So you're, you have this presumption of national ownership, should any party, you know, regardless of the location, attempt to claim infringement against you. One of the other kind of advantages is you can sue in federal court. So unregistered trademarks in general, you're not al allowed to bring a case for infringement in federal court unless you meet certain requirements. Uh, if anybody wants to know these requirements, you're more feel free to, you know, in raise your hand or send a comment out there in the, in the comment section. Uh, if you have a federal registered trademark with these, you can automatically have the right to sue in federal court, which, like I mentioned before, it allows you to kind of recover greater damages in comparison to state court. Also kind of one of the benefits of having a registered trademark is you can actually prevent counterfeit goods coming in from overseas. And you can actually register your trademark, which is another, another fancy, instead of you're not really registering with the Customs and Border Patrol, you're just making a recording with them that, hey, I have a registered trademark and this kind of gives you the right to prevent other uh, consumer or other companies of importing goods that you have protection for. And kind of one of the other big advantages of having a registered trademark is that you gain implicit proof of validity. So within an unregistered and unproven mark, essentially the burden lies on you to prove trademark right exists should another party try to infringe your name. So what, what this really means is you'll need to prove continuous use in commerce of that trademark. And you can also face questions whether your mark is distinct enough to qualify for protection. However, when it's registered, your trademark, I mean, the proof is right there. It's in the registration. That's, you know, that's the, you know, the name of the game is getting in registered. So you have this presumptive approval of ownership. So essentially, the only way to be truly sure of your, if your trademark's valid, is file an application for registration in the Trademark and Patent Office, which they'll essentially file what is known as a trademark application, and it gets examined by the Patent Office, and they let you know if you your trademark qualifies or doesn't qualify for protection. So kind of diving in into really, how do we prove trademark infringement? Now, let's, let's just say, assuming you have a register and register trademark, how is this actually done? So courts have kind of developed what is known as a substantial likelihood of confusion test. And this test essentially kind of boils down to determine whether your business is likely to suffer injury to its reputation or name or name being or is the name being diluted. So there's essentially a lot of factors that go in that are considered and weighted to determine whether there's a substantial likelihood of confusion. Uh, the court weighs the factors in some instances may weigh other factors more heavily than others. And in some instances, they might not even consider all the factors. Uh, so now you're probably asking, well, what are the factors? I think it's probably best visualized through an example of the famous case of Lexus versus Lexus, <laughs> yeah. if that didn't confuse anybody. So I'm, I'm sure everybody's kind of at this point kind of familiar with the Toyota's luxury brand Lexus, Lexus with a U. I'll probably say that to kind of distinguish from Lexus with the I. However, in the 1980s, when Toyota kind of brought Lexus to the market, no, not everybody knew about, you know, what was Lexus as now. And metadata, which owned the trade name Lexus with an I, believe that Lexus, the, you know, the being manufactured Toyota diluted their name. So a little bit about metadata or med data, I'm sorry, or me data is a me, uh, me data. It provides computerized legal research services under the trade name Lexus with an I. So Mead president came up with the mark essentially in, in 1972, and it's a combination of two words. So Lex, which is Latin for law and IS for information systems. So Meads, through extensive sales and advertising in the computerized legal research, made Lexus a, a very strong mark in that field. So like I was saying, the 1980s really was 1987, 87 Toyota announced that the new luxury vehicle, Lexus with the U, 
And what's interesting, their marketing pitch was directed to well-educated professional consumers. Uh, and what's also interesting, before they actually adopted the artificial name of Lexus with the U for its automobile, Toyota actually went out and secured legal advice that there would be no conflict between, you know, Lexus with an I and Lexus with a U. Well, me data disagreed and they sued them claiming, you know, their mark is being diluted by Toyota's use of Lexus with the U. Uh, how did the court determine if they were or were not diluting the mark? Well, they used what, as I mentioned, the substantial likelihood of confusion test and, and the factors, as you can see, they're listed on the screen. And kind of one of the main factors was the, was the sophistication of the consumers as essentially was the largest contributing factor in concluding that, that the consumers would not be confused and there would be no dilution. And this is because the strength and distinctness of Lexus with an I was essentially limited to the market of, of its services that it was for attorneys and accountants. Outside that market, um, nobody knew, you know, what Lexus with an I was actually selling. Uh, and the court stated because only essentially 1% of the population associated Lexus with an I with Mead services, it couldn't say that Lexus with an I identifies that service to general public and distinguishes it from others, such as Lexus with a U. So in, in conclusion, the court said that, hey, there's no blurring between Lexus with an I and Lexus with the U. And that, that reason being that, you know, lawyers and accountants were much more, were very sophisticated and they knew the difference between the two. And, and the ironic part, as Igor mentioned, was they were actually marketed to the same people. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, go figure. Yeah. So kind of now diving into what is a generous sized trademark? So essentially, how does, how does a trademark become generous sized? So generousization occurs when basically the trademark owner would fail to provide an alternative generic name. So one of good examples is like Otis Elevator Company. They actually advertise well, their elevator is an elevator and, you know, did not identify the product in any other way. And further generalization occurs when the owner uses a trademark in a similar fashion to, term, to generic terms, I'm sorry. But however, in most cases, it occurs when the owner simply just doesn't educate the public or business or consumers as to what the term, why the term is not generic. And this is kind of, I would say in, in majority cases, which is kind of highlighted by our example here of King Sealy Thermos versus Atlantic Industries. So kind of a little background information on, on, on King Sealy. So in 1907, King Sealy basically started advertising the term Thermos to describe what is essentially a vacuum insulated bottle for food and beverages. Initially, they made no attempt to actually make any designation of term as a, as a trademark or of a source of their product. And over the years, actually, the consumers started using it as a generic term to describe the product category as basically vacuum insulated bottles. And I would say, I think it was about 20 years later, they said, hey, we probably should do something because it's starting to become very generic. So they actually undertook a campaign to, to identify Thermos as a trademark. However, they didn't really I guess, put their best effort into the campaign and because they kind of some, to some extent put on the back burner and by 1950, Thermos has just become nearly synonymous with what a vacuum insulated bottle is. And a little bit later there, shortly thereafter, Aladdin Industries developed its own vacuum insulated bottle and just sold as a Thermos bottle. And Thermos brought a trademark basically suing Aladdin saying, hey, you're using our Thermos trademark. The court disagreed to some extent. So the court noted that between 1954 and 1957, uh, Kinsley Thermos tried to stop widespread generic use of the thermos. However, it wasn't enough as basically, it has firmly impressed on the American public that thermos is a generic term. In other words, King Sealy was way too late and they just didn't do enough to stop the term being genericized and their efforts kind of fell short because they weren't trying to continuously educate the public and consumers that, hey, this is not a generic term. In reaching its inclusion, the court kind of considered factors, kind of, as you can see listed on the screen, and they consider whether the word was generic is, I'm sorry, if the whether the word is generic is public awareness of generic words. So in other words, 
how much of the population knew it was essentially a generic word and not a trademark. In Seeley's case, everybody treated it as a generic word. Most, most people didn't know it was a trademark. And they also looked at it, what is the public's understanding of the word? For example, did thermos and vacuum bottles meant the same thing to the public. There was no distinction. And although King Seeley lost on the thermos mark, they were still entitled to using thermos with a capital T, uh, which Aladdin was not. So I guess they, they kind of won, I guess, to some extent, but they didn't get what they really were after. And here's a kind of a, I guess, other generous size trademarks. We have a list here. Uh, as you can tell that, you know, trampoline, dry ice, as I mentioned, escalator, flip phones. I, that, that one was kind of one of the interesting ones I thought because I didn't know flip phone was a generic term. Uh, there's kerosene, uh, laundromats, videotape, and then, you know, the blizzard. I think, Mike, Mike you had yeah. some interesting story about the blizzard. I thought it was... So, so, so the blizzard, to me, is the one that's got to be on the cusp of losing its, its uh, originality and, and becoming a genericized uh, phrase. Because, like, to describe a blizzard, you'd have to say it's a soft-serve ice cream with a candy mix-in. Nobody, I've never heard it described as that. In, in fact, you know, I would challenge anybody in, that's watching this to go to a, a, a soft serve uh, ice cream parlor and they invariably have some ripoff of the blizzard where they call it like they have the McFlurry, the Whiteout, the Wizard. And if you ask a clerk what those are, they will, they will almost always say, oh, they're like a blizzard. So, they're, so clearly the term is, is becoming generic. Um, and, you know, the, on a funny side story, the, uh, my local Dairy Queen uh, was advertising that uh, if they didn't flip the blizzard over, uh, you know, for you, you got a you got a free coupon for one. And they were wearing all these shirts that said "flippable blizzards," but they're <laughs> but they they had some. Their ice cream is always melting, always, always. I don't think they've got a very good freezer at that unit, and uh, so they were serving them all in to-go cups. And I tried to ask for my free. Uh, blizzard coupon and they tried to tell and they told me that oh they don't flip them here i'm gonna go why are you wearing a shirt that says you do so you know it, it's uh it's certainly something I, I i think blizzard is a perfect example of something that's been so successful that it's now almost hurting the company and so what i want everyone to take away from this this whole section is that a genericized trademark is a problem you'd love to have right i mean mm -hmm. every single one of the products that we've identified the thermos um, the dry ice, all of these things are so ubiquitous that, you know, somebody made millions, probably hundreds of millions on each one of those products. So if you get to that stage, you know, by all means, we'd, be, we'd, be lo we'd love to help you with your intellectual property matters because obviously you are a well-capitalized company. So that will transition into copyright. Um, so the first thing is, we'll talk about like what exactly is a copyright. So, you know, copyrights can cover computer code, advertisements, basically anything that could be an original work, an artistic work that has some sort of physical manifestation of expression. Oh, hold on a second. I think the screen is getting covered up here. All right. Um, a, phys a physical manifestation of, of the expression. So, um, and it's also important to understand that you create the copyright as soon as you reduce that manifestation into some sort of tangible medium that can be that can be copied or reproduced somehow. Like if you if you print a book, if you if you store it even on a disk drive or anything, the copyright is is created instantaneously, uh, and you don't have to register. We'll talk about registration in a minute. But um, when it comes to infringement, uh, one of the one of the standard, almost reflexive defenses is what is the fair use doctrine. And we get questions from, from people all the time about this. Well, doesn't that count as fair use? Um, pretty much anytime somebody's accused of, of infringement, that's what they, what they say. And so just so as an understanding of what the fair use doctrine is, is that it, it, it's non-commercial use of a copyright material. So if you're writing an article, and we have these pictures uh, that we'll get to in a second of vanilla ice and Freddie Mercury there. And in, in the case where you're just including the material just to refer to who the people are, you know, like if you just 
use the name Vanilla Ice to represent the individual and you're not trying to make money off the actual sell of the name, you know, you're allowed to write an article that mentions, mentions them without paying a, a, a license. But we almost always see questions about, well, can I use it in fair use when they're trying to somehow make money off it? And, that's, and this is a lot more complicated legal issue. It's, very, it's, it's an overused rule, I would say, uh, that, uh, that, that a lot of people try to assert it and it's not always successful. The reason why we have the picture here of, of Vanilla Ice and Freddie Mercury is because uh, the song Ice Ice Baby uh, used uh, bass riffs from uh, the, the Queen song Under Pressure. Um, and I think, I think as well, uh, David Bowie also worked on the original Under Pressure song, if, if memory serves me correct there. And, and originally, um, there wasn't any royalties or uh, credit given to the original authors. But after the song became really popular, they didn't bring a lawsuit, but there was some out-of-court negotiation, and they, and they now have credit. Uh, the, the Freddie Mercury and the other members of Queen have credit. Uh, as well as uh, uh, I think David Bowie uh, for the Ice Ice Baby song, and they collect some of the royalties. So that's a and that's a good example of how IP can work really well without a lawsuit. Somebody, you know, uh, if you hear the two songs, you, you clearly can identify the bass riff that that the one uses. Uh, but uh, you know, where you know you would like some sort of compensation for your so, okay, so, so a lot of the questions is do you have to register copyright? And unlike a trademark, um, which you know you can get by with a, a, a low trademark, but you need to register as soon as possible. Uh, Okay, the, the general rule we have, right, is do you need to register it if you're going to bring a lawsuit, you know, about it. So you can read, so you make it work, and if it's really working, you're making a commercial product, then you probably should copyright, because you might, if you think there's any chance you might bring it, you miss it. But if, you know, if you're just writing um, something for, you, you know, it's going to be on YouTube, producing something on YouTube, that you're not really going to care too much if, if somebody infringes, um, you know, it, it's probably not in your best interest to, to bother with, you know, hey, Mike. copyright. Um, your audio is a little mumbled, Mike. Okay, hold on a second. Is that any better? Yeah, that's a lot better. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for uh, pointing that out, Caroline. Sorry if right. anyone. Um, so, so in the and the general rule is if you're going to bring, and, and there's a lot of legal jargon there, if you bring a lawsuit, uh, you have to have it registered at the time that the suit's brought, but you don't have to register before. Hey, Mike, sorry, it's a little mumbled again. It went back to mumbled. Back to mumbled, mm -hmm. huh? Here, I'm going to unmute my mute yeah, that unmute. one. I'm going to unmute myself. I can't hear anything, uh, but, but it'll allow me to probably get a better... Okay. okay. Uh, can you? you I, I, I muted myself. All right. All right. Well, well. Un, un, turn up the volume. Turn up the volume. Because I got to hear if, if, if Caroline, Caroline can hear can us. Hear us. Caroline. And then there's just a bit of an echo. I think Igor might need to turn down his audio and then. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll have to have have mute and, and turn off your audio. All, All right. right. Well, we'll do the best we can at this. I don't know why we're having technical difficulties today. So, um, well, in any event, uh, the, the, you, you register it if you want to bring a suit. And before then, you know, it, it's, or if you know you're never going to bring a suit, if you're just making it as a hobby project or something like that, then you really don't need to worry about cop, uh, registering the trademark. So we wanted to give some examples of, you know, trademark or copyright infringement. Um, and the legal test is the substantial similarity. And so they wanted to look at, is this, you know, is it a direct copy, which is the easy case, or is it a derivative work, which is the much more subtle case? Um, and they look at a lot of different factors, uh, but, but more uh, than anything else when it comes to an artistic work is, do they, look, do they have like repeated elements, um, you know, that are common to both and the message being conveyed uh, by both of them. Uh, now, a couple of the factors that we list there uh, 
like fictitious entries um what is is related to the concept of what what was originally with paper towns they made a movie actually called paper towns uh, a couple of years ago that that mentioned this concept um so you know before computers uh, cartographers would make maps and part of the way that they would try to prevent copying is that um they would uh put a fake city in the map the, the best thing that came to mind was that if you've seen the movie mr deeds the town west chesterton fieldville iowa um that uh was obviously fake uh but it turned out it was real in the movie but if you put that into a map that you made now somebody else comes along and they copy the map and they put that fake city in there now they're gonna have a real hard time explaining to the court well i didn't copy this you know i didn't even know about this map was here well, why is this town uh included as well when it's when it, was, it doesn't exist outside of this map so um and and then the last one was more just uh the the mcdowell's in the movie um uh, coming to America and the buy more in uh, the, the TV show Chuck were, were great examples of very crude uh, efforts to, they were really parody companies of, of, the, of McDonald's and uh, Best Buy respectively. Um, but in the real life, you see companies like that that pop up that are clear ripoffs, but they don't last very long. So they don't usually make it to federal court because the, the, the parent company comes in and uh, squashes them uh, pretty quick. So if you look on the right of this, the, uh, this, the, this slide, we have two cases, uh, one where there was infringement and one when there was not infringement. And in both cases, the, the picture on the left represented the original work and the picture on the right represented the um, alleged infringing work. So if you look at the first one, the Kerr versus New, York Mag New Yorker magazine, uh the the court said that they were similar but they didn't didn't involve uh copyright infringement because the 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 original work was very edgy um and whereas the 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 uh new yorker magazine uh was more serene uh, used uh, a lot of neutral colors and created a more relaxed feel to it so they were basically looked at the message conveyed by both, and, and that was really the controlling factor and why they said, because one was clearly inspired, that one on the right was clearly inspired by the one on the left, but they said it wasn't enough to, to, to be considered a derivative work. So then that brings us to the second one on the bottom, and I have a better slide because I don't think that one showed it well. Uh, this shows just those, those two uh, pictures. The, uh, Picture on the left is called The View of the World from Ninth Avenue uh, and was uh, in the New Yorker magazine um, in the 1970s and, and probably one of their most famous covers of all time. And if you know anybody from New York, this is often how they view the world. Uh, that, you know, what, what they're trying to convey is Ninth Avenue and 10th Avenue is shown in all this detail. And then as you get further away from New York City, everything becomes a lot less important. Uh, on a side note, I went, I went to college with a guy from New York, and uh, I happened to know that the Roebling Bridge in Cincinnati was the model uh, for the Brooklyn Bridge, and he refused to believe this and bet me $20 that I, that I was wrong, and we looked it up, and I, of course, was right, um, and uh, I offered to let him off the bet if he just admitted that, you know, that they used it as the model, and he gave me the $20 and said that he refused to accept that some hick town had anything on uh, New York City. So any people that, uh, you know, a lot of people from New York City, you'll know, invariably know some of them that uh, have that, uh, the view that if it happens outside of, uh, even outside of Manhattan, like it just doesn't matter to them. And so they, they had that uh, in the New Yorker magazine. And then about 10 years later, uh, this Moscow on the Hudson poster was produced. And the, they admitted that uh, the New Yorker magazine inspired their poster for the movie, uh, and this was uh, Columbia Pictures producing it, and they were being sued by Steinberg, who was the original author uh, of the, or the artist for New, the New Yorker magazine. Um, and when they looked at it, they said, not only was it similar, it was providing, it was giving the same impression that both of the, you know, over importance of New York City compared to the rest of the world, and they actually uh, 
the, the Columbia Pictures uh, responded by arguing fair use, arguing that it was a, um, a parody. And because with a parody, anytime you have a parody, you can say you know, that, that it's not infringing. But it, interestingly enough, they said, no, no, it wasn't a parody because the New Yorker cover was a parody of, of the way New Yorkers thinks. You weren't making a parody of the parody. You were trying to make the same parody that the New Yorker magazine was made. So, and, and I found that would be a really kind of an interesting twist in the law. So that they were both parodies, but since you weren't making fun of the parody, then, then you didn't get to the parody protection that would otherwise be applied. So, so these two cases going back here, um, these two cases kind of to the best of my knowledge, draw the line better than any others of when you would and wouldn't have infringement on um, uh, two artistic works. So going forward, because um, it's much more relevant to, to the group we're presenting is uh, software copyright infringement. Um, now, practically everybody I imagine that I'm talking to knows what a zip file is, but most of you are not old enough uh, to know where zip files came from. Um, and, uh, and, and I am unfortunately uh, as a man of my mid forties. I can remember when zips were new and, and they used to be PK zips. And they were called that because the original programmer was a guy named Phil Katz. But before he created PK zip, he actually worked for a company called C. And C made this ARC program that made this dot ARC compression format. And Phil Katz left C started his own company called PKWare and created PKARC, which was totally compatible with the dark, could also make the dot arc format. And of course it could make the dot same dot arc format because he used the same code. When uh, C brought a lawsuit against PKWare, they had an independent uh, uh, company come in and compare the code. And they said it was basically identical, but going back to that paper towns example, of those you know, special marks, the comments in the code were identical, including the misspellings. And so they clearly it was a derivative work. Um, and as a result, they settled out of court uh, and PKWare uh, transitioned to the .zip file, which was actually better than a .arc file. Uh, and that's the one that we still use today. Which, so I thought this case was interesting just because you know, the, the lawsuit and the force, fo forced a company to actually improve the code because the dot zip format was like 30% more effective than the, or uh, had a better compression ratio than the dot arc uh, format, if I remember right, back in the 80s when this was going on. Um, but, you know, had that they not been successful in their lawsuit and PKWare could have used the arc, I don't know how long it would have been before we improved that, that, that compression. So by requiring that, we, uh, we actually got a better product, but that's also the background of the .zip file. So, in case, uh, in case you ever wanted to know. So, and Igor. Yeah. So now we're going to dive into what is a trade secret. Uh, really, there's the legal definition of what constitutes a trade secret. But if we break it really down, it's just it's just something used in a company's business that is not known or readily accessible by its competitors. It has obviously commercial value or that provides an advantage in that marketplace for that company. And the and the owner of the information protects uh, from disclosure through reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. So by definition, you can see that a trade secret cannot be protected under patent, trademark, or copyright law. It, this it means that if you do have a trade secret, you know, you're able to establish one. Uh, you couldn't divulge it to the public as a trade-off for the mentioned IP protection, but it no longer is going to be a trade secret then. So nearly every company has some type of secret that, you know, that kind of gives the, them an advantage in the marketplace. Uh, question really turns on, you know, did you, did the company make reasonable efforts to keep it a secret? And that, that's kind of where the challenge lies. And in kind of the, my experience from what I've seen is it, you gotta, it's better to go above and beyond, you know, than not to go far enough. And that's kind of, in, kind of uh, exemplified in this KFC example we have here on the screen. Uh, so a little bit about the KFC recipe. So essentially 
only one person in the world knows the combination of the safe. And actually what's interesting, maybe, I don't know if it's ironic that the safe is actually located on the same floor right across from the legal department. So uh, I don't know if you want to be breaking into the legal department at KFC, but so the actual recipe, only two people know what are the 11 herbs and spices that actually go into the Colonel's secret recipe and how much of each. And in fact, KFC even goes further. What it does is it uses two completely different companies to make the recipe, you know, parts of the recipe, and then uses a computer algorithm to blend it together. So, I mean, KFC might be kind of an extreme case, but I mean, as the saying goes, it's better to be safe than sorry. And, it, and I guess for a startup, what makes more sense, a trade secret or, you know, getting IP protection? In my experience, it's, it, it makes more valuable sense to have, you know, patent protection or a trademark protection because if your end goal is for, you know, to be acquired by a larger company, one of the main things they'll ask you, well, what IP protection do you have? And, you know, since trade secret isn't essentially, you know, an obtained IP protection until you actually are able to show it, you know, in court that it is a trade secret, you are essentially kind of playing yourself against or stacking the cards against your company. So in our experience, it's better to get a trademark or a copyright or a you know, copyright protection if, if your end goal is to, you know, acquisition. And, and that's on top of the fact that the, the, one of the worst parts about a trade secret is that, okay, let's, let's give the example of, you know, Igor breaks into KFC's uh, legal department and uh, snatches the, uh, the the, the, the recipe. Now he can't go, and they were able to prove that. that it really it comes down to be able. Did you can you prove that somebody else broke your uh, your, your your reasonable methods to protect the secret? Now they he could they could stop him from from starting a fried chicken company. But if he posts those plans on the internet, they can't do anything about that. Once the genie is out of the bottle, the secondary infringers that now get the legally get the the information for some, some other means, they you know KFC would have no recourse against them. So. So it, in, in the case of a lot of startups, if you're divulging your trade secrets to, uh, to companies, they'll find all sorts of legal room for trying to get out of uh, non-disclosure agreements and, and stuff like that. So, so, be, so tread lightly. So the next, uh, the next section um, and, the, our, and the most important section is patents. Um, and uh, Igor found some, some cool, uh, uh, old patents uh, for Monopoly. The one on the, uh, the the second to the left is uh, Mr. Potato Head of all things. And then the two on the right are both for uh, Simon the game. Um, and what I really liked in these two was that as most of you know, you can get a design patent that covers the aesthetic properties of a, of, of a manufactured product or you can get the functionality, which is the utility patent. And normally you go for the utility patent, but this is a good example of when the design patent was probably worth more because the functional operations were the press buttons on the, on the um, Simon. But my kids have a Simon that you know, was made just a couple of years ago. And instead of a, a push buttons, they have capacitive plates, touch plates uh, that, that are glass that are on the Simon and those would still be covered under a design patent, but they wouldn't be covered under a utility patent because they because they wouldn't be you know buttons as as we know it. So as as the technology changes, sometimes the uh, the design patents can anticipate more. It might be a that might not be the usual case, but it's definitely something to keep in mind if your if your product if you're like a graphical user interface or something has a particularly nice uh, aesthetic quality. So. Um, there's a couple of things that I absolutely want every single person to take away from this, this entire presentation. Uh, and, and one of them is what the word comprising means. So when you read a patent claim and every patent issued in America and every one that I know of anywhere in the world ends with at, with at least one claim, usually in the United States, there's about 20 claims. And they always read like this, a device comprising element A, element B and element C. The word comprising means that you read on any device that has all of A, B, and C. They might have more, they might have a million things, but they have at least A, B, and C. 
if you use the word consisting, and you almost never do in patent law, it's very, very rare. Um, of the 3,000 plus applications, I think I've seen it twice. Uh, that means that you only infringe on pro you only hold products as infringement that have exactly A, B, and C. They consist of A, B, and C. So that's a very important word to understand. The word in comprising, including, um, you know, words like that are considered to be open-ended, and they have, uh, it, and it means at least these elements. And so that segues into how do you read this claim. Now, normally you have, let's say, one, three independent claims and 17 dependent claims. And so claim one reads like a device comprising element A, element B, and element C. And then uh, claim two has, you know, further comprising element D. So now you're looking at a device uh, that's out in the, in the market. You say, is this infringing on this patent? And you see uh, the, the first device has elements A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Now that would be infringing of both claims because of the word comprising. It has all of the elements of both claims. Now the second one uh, in, has A, B, and C and not D would only infringe claim one. But it's interesting to note that you only need to infringe one claim. If you infringe 20 claims versus one claim, um, that, that only impacts the enforceability of the patent or the validity of the patent. It doesn't diminish your damages in any way, shape, or form. So, or enhance them if they, inf in, if they happen to infringe on all 20 claims. Uh, so, so it's important to understand the difference there, but, but, it, but that's just how you read it. So you would see that, that uh, the second uh, device would only infringe on claim one and not on claim two. Now, the, the third uh, device has elements B and C. And so it doesn't infringe on either claim one or claim two because both claim one and claim two have element A. They require an infringing device to have element A. And that's, you know, that's the, the 1,000 foot view of how you'd make a cursory determination if a, a device is infringing. So let's move from that to a real world example that um, anybody that's a woodworker uh, is familiar with saw stop and i want to i want to play a video that hopefully we have sound for now this this went better in uh our practice than it did uh today so i don't know if i'm going to be able to connect this this video to our oh there we go Okay, so anybody that's not familiar with the salt stop, that hot dog represents your finger. <laughs> and you see, as soon as the blade touches, the brake activates. and it pulls the blade down. So as background for saw stop, saw stop was started by a patent attorney named Steve Gass. Um, and he initially attempted to license this technology to other table saw manufacturers, but he was rebuked from the increase in cost. Uh, and these other table manufacturers didn't want to admit that their table saws were dangerous in the first place to avoid liability there. Um, so he started his own company. And why I mentioned that he was a patent attorney is because he had, Saw Stop's company had some of the best IP that you will find in any startup I've ever seen. They had well over 120 patents on the saw and probably from every conceivable angle that you could, that you could imagine. Um, so there haven't been many attempts to, uh, of other companies to bring a competitor saw on but Bosch tried, and I want to show you the video, hopefully it's a little easier, of the video for Bosch showing how their saw worked. So you saw the, important to note, you saw the brake system 
on the uh, the stall stop. So they have the sort of the same thing with, you know, a finger getting in and, you know, they show a guy getting distracted and boom, the saw blade drops below the table. Now this video here, this part here, they use technology from their airbag division uh, to create a small explosion that initiates that saw blade going down. Now they tried to argue, well, this is better product because it doesn't damage the saw blade. And anybody that's owned the saw stop that's activated one, I own a saw stop, but I've been, not only do I have all 10 fingers, I've never activated it. Um, the, uh, it typically ruins your saw blade. Um, small price to pay in my opinion for keeping one of your fingers. Uh, but you know, they were advertising advantage because it just drops below the, the table and spins. It doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't crash into a, uh, a break. And so they contended that it didn't infringe. Bosch was building these uh, Reacts saws in uh, a Taiwan, I believe. And um, SawStop brought a, a suit in the International Trade Commission that controls the importation of goods. And the ITC is a good area to expedite instead of bringing it in federal suit for damages, they're just trying to block the, you know, the importing of the, of the product. Um, and the ITC found that they infringed on two patents uh, of like the 120 that, that uh, SawStop owned. And let's take a look at, at one of them. Yep. So of the infringing patent, if you look at these, this is literally what the patent has in claim seven of uh, patent number 7,900,008, uh, 95927, however that number reads. Uh, and, and you have a, a, a work uh, work, woodworking machine comprising, just as I noted, a work surface defining a cutting region, a tool, uh, a cutting tool, a detection system, and then it has a reaction system. Now it's note, here that the reaction system is configured to retract the cutting tool below the work surface within approximately 14 milliseconds. And it's important to note they don't specify in this claim how uh, that they how they they bring that that saw blade below. They just specify that it's done. And and compare that then to this next patent that saw stop owns, um, where they actually have a similar structure for the claim, except they have this break configuration to engage and stop the blade. So they, in this, in this patent, they do specify how it comes down. And, and so this was not an infringe, you know, Bosch did not infringe on this patent, but you didn't, they didn't need to infringe on all of them. They only needed to infringe on one of them. And I, I wanted to bring back to this point here, because we see this issue a lot with people you see on the internet, oh, these products are totally different. You can't look at the pro you can't look at both products. You have to look at the patent and then the infringing product. It's, it's a big mistake to say that the final products are different because that doesn't mean what the patent coverage is. Apple, going back to, to what Igor was saying earlier, they have a huge IP portfolio and they patent a lot of products that they aren't going to develop because they like the Apple Watch. <coughs> the, I, I was talking with in-house counsel at Apple. And he was telling me several patents they got um, were just on inferior versions of it. You know that they wanted to make sure that a competitor couldn't make a something that looked very similar but might operate worse. Uh, and so they they had their inventor say, "Well, okay, you did it the best way. Now, what if you only had half the budget and and you know uh, you wanted it to not keep time as well or not do as many things? What would you do then?" And then they go and they patent that as well. So it's very it's for a patent hearing, it's irrelevant what the patent owner's company does. It's only matter of what the patent says and then what the infringing product or the alleged infringing product has. So that kind of, and, and, and that's the, the second takeaway I want everyone to have from this. In addition to understanding consisting and comprising, know that the, the patent owner's product is not relevant for analysis of patent infringement. And that will open us up to questions. Uh, Igor, you wanna turn your microphone back on so we can hear Caroline?
Thanks so much, Mike and Igor. Just let me know when you guys can hear me. While they're getting that figured out, um, I encourage if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat box. I do see one. And once I get the thumbs up from Mike and Igor, I'll read it out loud to them. But that was a great presentation. I, I also want to remind everyone that um, this was recorded, so you'll be able to find it on Riot's YouTube channel and on the Meetup page where you registered. So, Mike and Igor, let me know when you can hear me. OK, now we can hear you. Can you hear us again? Yeah. I can. Thanks, okay. guys. All right. I have a question from Matthew here. Where is the gray area when computer applications are involved? Because there is a whole, almost always a computer involved. You know what? And, and that's, a, that's a great question that the gray area is pretty much how I make my living. Um, so the, I, could, I, could, I could be given 30 hours and I still wouldn't be able to answer the, the question completely. But what I can say is that uh, patent protection is often used for patent application for computer applications um, because uh, you focus on what the program does, not what is written on the program. A copyright's only for software is only going to protect you for the code that you develop to do a specific function. And just as a real rudimentary example, you know, in C++, you can have a for loop, a while loop, or a do while loop do all the same thing and not necessarily be a cop, one be a copy of the other. So in that case, you wanna have patent protection that focuses on what the software does, not exactly how it, you know, not the code going from A to B. Um, and how you patent software, we've given another we have another presentation uh, that we gave about a year ago that covered that. If you know, if that's something of interest, we'll talk with Caroline and maybe that'll be our next presentation. But there is tons and tons of gray area when it comes to software applications. But rest assured that if it's a technical software application, if you're a technical advantage, and what that word means, I, again, that's, I could go on for hours about. But if you want a technical advantage to the software application, then it's then it covers under patent protection if it's a if it's a user interface that's the the improvement and it's the aesthetic qualities you can get a design patent uh otherwise you, you know you might still uh copyright would at least stop a direct infringer and you can also put a lot of trademark work into software to stop somebody from ripping off your logos or stuff like that so i, I think that's the, the best short answer i can give there that's very helpful, Mike. And again, I encourage anyone if they they have additional questions after this to please reach out to Mike and Igor. They're always extremely helpful. The next question that I have here, Mike, is in your experience, what percent of technical patent infringement suits are one decided out of court, two decided by a judge, and three decided by a jury? And let me know if I need to repeat any of that. Okay. Well, I just <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to two and three because that's the, the, the difference between what is decided by a judge and what's decided by a jury. Um, I, I, I honestly wouldn't even check if I was, if I was uh, reading a case and a decision about patent infringement. I wouldn't bother to look and see if it, was, if it was a jury decision or a judge decision because in both cases, there's still going to be issued there's gonna be decisions rendered by judges, whether it was motivated by a jury or not. Um, but about 90% of cases are settled outside of court uh, when, when you bring, uh, and, and, and I say 90%, like from the time you assert a patent, you, know, you notify that a, uh, a potential infringer that they might be uh, infringing, from that point forward, about nine times out of 10, it's settled before a judgment is rendered uh, by the court. Unfortunately, what happens a lot of times when you uh, go to court is that the patent is declared invalid uh, for a bunch of reasons that, again, I could go on for hours about. Um, but that ha so, so once it gets to court, it's a lot more murky. And that's why this like and that's true with any area of law. That's why lawyers avoid court. Because we know what happens in settlement negotiation, we can control that. But once we go to a third party, because we can't come to an agreement as far as if, you know, the terms of the patent or, you know, if, if there's an infringing product, um, you know, 
now we have a lot more ambiguity. And that's when also it gets crazy because the, the patent suit then goes from, let's say, a license fee of, of a couple hundred thousand dollars for a, a smaller invention to say, OK, well, I had to pay to bring this suit and I've already sunk a million dollars of legal fees. Now I want $30 million. I want $100 million. And that's when you see these ridiculous judgments or, or lawsuits raised because once the other defending party is refusing to settle um, or the plaintiff isn't reasonable, it won't both happen, then it, it escalates and the value of the case goes up considerably because there's so much ambiguity. So once you cross that 10% that threshold, that's when you see those huge sums of money that are at, at, at question for patent infringement cases. But, but before you get to that point, most you know, a lot of cases are settled for a couple hundred thousand dollars. It just depends on, you know, depends on how much the product is worth to the market and, and how good the patent is written in the first place. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. Those are all the questions I'm seeing. I'll leave it open for just another minute. If anybody has additional questions, please put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Just getting some positive feedback. Great webinar. Again, this will be posted to the YouTube channel and meetup page. I'm going to, um, in the chat box here, put Mike and Igor's email address, and you can always reach out to me, and I can directly connect you to either one of them. Um, but thank you so much for being with us, Mike and Igor. Wonderful very, um, and informative presentation, as always, from you guys, and I hope next time it'll be in person. Yeah, yeah. I, I, hope it's, I, hope, I hope it's in person next time. Yeah. I, I'm seeing some comments that we had some audio problems. I hope those were resolved and, and people, you know, I hate listening to the static when I'm in a presentation, but it happens. That being said, please give us your feedback, not just for this, this uh, presentation, but if there's an IP matter that you don't, that you'd like to have answered and you think, and if we decide if we can't answer it quickly, or even if we can, it might inspire us for uh, another, um, uh, another presentation that we could give that could that that other people have the same um, the, the same ideas because we do we don't want to give the same presentation over and over and over uh, as you know this is our third one and, and they've all been different um, so we'd like to get your feedback on what you need to know to help entrepreneurs so yep. yeah just lots of great feedback here and the the audio was fixed very quickly so okay great um, great yeah we got that figured out guys but um thanks well, everyone, everyone for the positive feedback and. Thanks Everyone for have a great us. day. And Caroline, thank you so much for setting this up. And, and you know, again, we're, we're hoping we'll see you all in person sometime in 2021. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Take care. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye.